And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued, chastised every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I shall offend against the generation of my children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. May the Lord bless this word this morning to our hearts and help us to understand. And you can be seated. In the... Uh, Human biographies that we read of great people and different heroes that we have, the imperfection of those heroes are very seldom ever exposed. The author purposely covers them up, their weaknesses and their frailties and so on and so forth, and they see no reason why that they should recall all the bad about their hero and the one they're writing about. And there are many, many, many reasons why that they should keep them hidden. They sell more copies. But this cannot be said about the Bible. That's why that the Bible becomes so real and so good and so truthful. In the scripture you see not only the strengths, but it almost seems at times that the weaknesses are magnified above the strengths. And even the greatest heroes, it seems that God Almighty makes sure that his word points out the weaknesses also. I know and you know the reason why that this is done. It is done, number one, to let us know that they are nothing but flesh as you and I. And number two, and even maybe more predominantly, and maybe it is the central focus, is that we understand that there's only one good and one perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. You can look in the Bible and you see Adam, the one that was made in the image of God, perfect and upright, but yet we read in the garden where he fell in sin. You can read of Noah, the one that was just and the only righteous man that was found throughout the whole earth. When the violence and the wickedness, much as today, was ruling and reigning in the world, and God sought for a man whereby that he might save the world. And he only found one, and that one was Noah. The scripture said that he was perfect and upright in his way, but later on you read where Noah actually, <clears throat> actually sinned. Did a horrible, 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 horrible sin with members of his own family. You can look at Lot. And Lot seemed to be a real nice fellow and a real nice man, followed after his uncle Abraham, but <clears throat> he got his eyes on Sodom and actually ended up living in Sodom and rubbing elbows and seemed to be pretty close friends to the Sodomites of Sodom. And finally had to be led out of the city of Sodom, that wicked, vile, corrupt place, by the hands only of an angel, and then settled in the mountains where that he got drunk. You can look at Moses, and Moses seemed to be a man that was almost perfect. Scripture said that he was the meekest man in the, in the earth, and I can believe that. He pastored four million people. <clears throat> Meekness comes to the least of us when we pastor 50 or more or less. I can imagine when you pastor four million how meek that you can become. 
and how humbled that you would have to be. But Moses, even in his greatness, even in his greatness and even in his youth, he committed murder. But then later on when God forgave him, then he criticized God and God wouldn't let him go in the promised land because of that criticism. Saul was the head and shoulders above all that was in Israel, but he forgot God. And you see him in his last days prancing up and down in his tent when God had departed. He finally took his life. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the apple of God's eye, the one that loved the Lord more than it seemed others, but we see him committing the hideous sin of adultery and murder. You can go to Peter, and Peter seemed to be the strongest of all of the disciples. He was ready to cut the high priest, servant of the high priest's ear off, and even his head probably, and I always felt like that Peter was aiming at the high priest, servant of the high priest's head, and he just missed and hit his ear. But even Peter in his staunchness for the Lord, he denied him. You can look at the John Marks and they forsook the Lord and the disciples and went back to Jerusalem. And you can go to the Demases and it says that having loved this present world, so on and on and on and on and on you can go in the characters of the scripture. And the thing that, that uh, reminds me to look further in the scripture about these characters is, and the reason why that probably I can identify with them and I can even have empathy on them is because they are so much like you and I. Our psalmist today tells us of such a man. He was more certainly, more certainly passed through a period that it seemed that he almost doubted God. Give me a little more up here on these only. <clears throat> let, me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Have you ever, ever, ever been plagued by the dark clouds of doubt and discouragement and fear? And even to the degree and to the point and to the precipice of saying, Does God care? Where is God? And in those words, whether they're sounded in frustration or fear, or in a moment of anxiety, yet they do feed on the seeds of doubt in the soul of man. I doubt God. And the scripture tells us that anything that is not of faith is sin. So it seems that maybe that doubt can actually develop into sin. But dare any of us say that we haven't been there. Dare any of us say that we never doubt God? No, in desperation, many times we cry out, Why, God, has your faith ever wavered in doubt? While others, it seems, revel in prosperity and glee and no problems ever come to them. And it seems that they are not more righteous than I. In fact, most generally, I can see where that I'm more righteous than they. But while their world is flourishing, my world is crumbling. And I say, 
why? Have you ever really struggled in serving God? Everything was going wrong while others, it seemed, lived like the devil. But they could do no wrong. And nothing ever went wrong. And it would be encouragement to me to see them have trouble. And it would be uplifting in my spirit to see them cry once in a while. I read a book one time. It said when bad things happen to good people. And it just seems to me in serving the Lord many times that Bad things always happen to good people and bad things never happen to bad people. And it was this type of situation that our psalmist is in. Now, if you can identify, if you can identify with any of this man's doubts, let's try to understand and glean from a little of his observations on what he observed while serving the Lord. Now, in verse 2, verse 1, he starts out, and I think he gives us a little encouragement of how the story is going to end. For he did say, truly God is good to Israel, to such as of are a, of a clean heart. He is kind of encouraging us there that having a clean heart will pay off in the end. Having a clean heart is the best way to go. Having a clean heart is the will of God. Having a clean heart will bring the best results. And so he starts us out there, but then he plunges in to his problems that he was having. But as for me, my steps had most or well nigh slipped. I want to talk to you about walking in slippery places. Now, you know and I know that this is a spiritual cry. I almost lost out, he said. These are perilous cries. And actually they're coming from a good man's heart. For he has been serving the Lord. We know that. But somehow or another there were things that were happening in his life that caused problems and trouble and worry and grief and anguish and pain and doubt. My feet, they were slipping. The sword of the Spirit that I had clung to so valiantly and so bravely was slowly slipping from my hand and my grips. In other words, he was saying I wasn't as brave as I used to be. The shield of faith that I had stopped so many of the fiery darts of the wicked was dropping down out of maybe weakness out of the tiredness of the battle and the darts of the wicked were actually finding their target have you ever been hit by the fiery darts of the wicked 
Yes, they have found their mark at times. And we have felt their deadly sting. And we have held, felt the wound in which they cause. And we have to somehow or another get grips on it and get rid of them lest the wicked one, the enemy of my soul, will totally destroy me. His spiritual strength was so slowly ebbing away till it seemed that he could not any longer defend himself. Somebody better come to his rescue, he is saying. Somebody better help me. I'm weak. I need help. Our weakest moments, we cry out as the psalmist and say, Does God really understand what I'm going through? He goes further. In verse 3 he said, For I was envious of the foolish. Now, we are so guilty of looking outside of the realms of the faith and look at other people. We sometimes, as the children of God, are so envious of those outside of this fortress. We always look out there to the ones that are not putting their faith and trust in Jehovah and say, what about them? They're not suffering as we. The enemy of my soul wants me to get my focus off of him and get it on them. There is something, and we must understand, we ought to recognize it, and we had better never forget it, that there is a certain amount of glitter that this world has that entices my flesh and soul. It looks good to me. I enjoy it. And do you know what? I watch them, and they go about their way, and they partake of the things that, that God Almighty says I can't, but they are no better nor worse because of it. Why would it harm me? Look what they're enjoying. Look what they can do. Look what they can have. Why not me? I don't see where that it has harmed them that much. And the psalmist said, I was envious of the wicked. Have we ever been guilty of being envious to those that can sin? Envious to those that delve and uh, indulge into the cesspools of wickedness, of immorality, of worldliness, of frivolity, of the devil? Have I ever envied them? Has there ever been a question arise in my heart? I kind of wish I could do that. Why, you know and I know that it's true. And there are times that our feet come to the precipice of that wicky, wick, that slippery, slimy edge 
of doubt that I am tempted to fall over and to plunge into. I know that we don't like to face self, and I know that what I'm saying turns us wrong, but probably it turns us wrong because it's so right. And he is honest with himself, and sometimes you and I would be better off if we would be honest with ourselves and face ourselves and say, Hey, boy, my feet are near slipping. But most of the time we push it off and say, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'll be all right. Oh, no. Don't worry about me. I've got it together. Ah, keep on praying for me, but I'm all right. Yeah, you're all right. You're all right. You're right on the edge between the world and the fine line of being lost and saved. And one foot is already over the line and the other is on a banana peel. And all it takes is just a little push and you'll be gone, tumbling into the darkness of the doubt that has been haunting your heart. My God, let us wake up to the fact that sometimes we are on slippery ground. I've been there, you've been there. I look at other people and fire trials never bothers them. It used to really bother me. Now how come I'm always going through the fiery trials and the trouble and the test? But it seems that they are not. And I found out that God chastises those that he loves. And he whips real sons. And those that are born out of wedlock, he doesn't care about. He's got me in a training program. He's got me in boot camp. He's got me in a position that I might rule and reign one day. And so therefore, I've got to go through a few things. I was talking to Brother Dempsey last night and Brother... Galoni, Brother Dempsey was, went through the training and become a officer in the Marine Corps. Brother Galoni was a frogman. If you know anything about that training, you will understand a little about what they're saying. And they begin to tell us all of the things that they went through during training. And the military has its reasons for this. Its ultimate reasoning is, if you are going to be an officer in the Marine Corps, and you're going to be leading at least maybe a section or a company or whatever they call it, of 150 men, and you are under the fire of battle, we want to make sure that if you're going to quit, you're going to quit now in training and not out there and cause the death of 150 men. And to the frog men, we want to make sure that you can stand the pressure, not only physical but mental, that when we send you into a harbor, that you're going to get the job done and that you won't quit under stress. And they were telling about hell week that the frogmen go through one solid week without sleep dropping you in the ocean at night and making you make your way back home putting you on the lawn at night with only your your uh, swim trunks on and then water fanning back and forth and then coming up with a full pressured hose and sticking it in your mouth. Full pressure. If you fight it, they keep on doing it. If you relax and let them do it, they go on. But they want to try to break you under pressure. 
They'll take you and throw you into the filth and muck and mud in the bay, that black stuff, and throw it in your mouth and in your ears and your eyes. And then they begin to play with your mind and say, you're not fit for the Marine Corps, are you? You're not fit for it. And if they're, you're black, they'll talk about your blackness. If you're white, they'll talk about your whiteness. If you're little, they'll talk about your littleness. If you're big, they'll talk about your bigness. They'll try to break you and find out what they can do to destroy you mentally. If you will just crack. They play them. Play them mind game with you you're not fit for the marine car yes i am no you're not you're weak you're sissy i won't tell you all the things they do they try to do everything in their power to break your spirit well why do they do that some even die in the process. I'll tell you why. It is to find out how tough you are. Now, I am not saying that God Almighty does anything that to destroy your soul, but I will tell you this, that He has turned some of His people over to the devil to the, to the D D I, D O, I believe it, a drill officer, is that it? And say, he is yours. If you can make him crack, crack him. If you can make him crack, crack him. You can do anything that you want to short of death. That's exactly what God said to Job and the devil. I am telling you, this is no play game. This is no little Sunday school afternoon trip. You are fighting for your immortal soul. And if the devil can destroy you mentally or any other way, he is going to do it. If there is a love for worldliness in you, you're going to see ever glim and glitter of the lights of the world. If there is a speck of immorality in you, then the devil is going to make sure that you have the opportunity to commit all of the hideous immoral sins in the world. You are going to be tried. For well, the scripture tells me that when we finally make heaven, that there's no sin going to enter there. And the Lord's in the process of working all of that out of you right now. If you want to go to heaven, stick around. God will get you there. There's one thing about this training process. Any time, any time, any time you want to say, I quit, they'll release you and let you go. No questions asked. You're gone. That's what they're trying to do. Brother Galoni told me the last week of Hell Week, he said the last, last thing they want you to do. He said, uh, uh, the next to the last thing, he said, okay, this is Thursday night. You're free Friday morning. He said, now I want you to take, you take your raft, and they have, they have teams in the raft, and you go down San Diego Bay all the way down to the end, to Imperial Beach. You put your raft on your shoulders, and you walk all the way across the strand, and you get into the ocean, and you paddle all the way back uh, up to, to the base, and then you come in and get your, uh, get your raft on your shoulders, and come in to the to the base and it, it was a strenuous thing and they had been told by graduating classes 
Now look, they're going to tell you that, but don't believe them. When you get down at the end of San Diego Bay, they're going to have a bomb far there, and they'll tell you, okay, you've made it, go on back. But this one fellow, they kept, they, they, they saw a weakness in, in his, uh, and a flaw in his armor. And so they took the man and they told him what they were going to do. And he said, no, I quit. And the team said, don't give up. This is a, they're going to let you go at the end of the uh, San Diego Bay. They're going to let you go. No, it was a mental game. He could not believe it. He could not do it. And he gave up. Thursday night before they were to graduate Friday morning. The last test. They took them out on the beach. And it was about a quarter of a mile. And they said, okay, we're going to give you a choice. You can duck walk with the, your raft on your heads you can duck walk all the way down to around that bend down there and come back. And the first one that gets back, the first team that gets back is released. The rest of you have to go the rest of the day. Now, you can have a choice. You can either duck walk or you can, you can slither like a snake on your belly. I said, I've never done that. I didn't know what they were talking about. Now, take your choice. Which one you want? And there was one Puerto Rican stood up and said, Sir, we don't want one of them. We want to do both of them. And the men in, the, in, their, in their little group, they wanted to strangle that idiot. They wanted to strangle him and say, You idiot. But the D.I., he said, good, that's what we're looking for, dismissed. You see, they wanted to push them to the nth degree of their endurance, but in their spirit. They wanted to find men that would go the second mile, that would take everything that they dished out and said, give me more, I'm able to take it. My God, give me men. For God that will say, you can't dish enough out to me, devil. That's right. That's right. Amen. Sometimes we ought to talk to the devil and say, devil, you can't dish enough out to me. I can take anything you've got and still say more. Did not the Lord say that he would be with you? That he would never leave you nor forsake you. Did not the Lord say, I'll not put any more on you than what you are able to bear? <laughs> Child, I'm telling you, you ought to remember one thing. Especially you that are walking in slippery places. You that are dwelling now in some of these slippery places with your walk with God. You that are about to throw in the towel. You that are about to wave the white flag and say, I quit. You that are about ready to take the ten count. I give up. Let me tell you. The conditions of the saints of God is far better at their worst than the Devil's people are at their best. The happiness that they have is from the outside and the outside only. 
the happiness that you and I have, it will come from the inside. Hallelujah. The happiness that springs from the sensational is usually also sensual. But the happiness that you and I have that springs from the spirit inside is spiritual and eternal. It'll never fail. It'll never fail. It'll never fail. It'll never fail. Once in a while, the Lord drops a, just a little something in my soul that makes me so grateful. This past week, that happened to me. It was just, I think, the Holy Ghost calling to my remembrance some of the glories and the blessings that I enjoy from serving the Lord. And I began to thank the Lord all over in my heart of the many blessings that He has blessed me with while serving Him. They far exceed anything that I could have ever enjoyed out in the world. Yes, I live a restricted life, if you want to call it. If you call being restricted, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't lay around in everybody's bedroom, you can't cuss, you can't rob, you can't steal. If you call that restriction, yes, I live a very restricted life. But I will tell you, the restrictions that are on... And the scripture came to me, Delight thyself in the law of the Lord, and He will give you the desire of your heart. I see some of the things, the great desires of my heart, that I'd never thought that I would see, but suddenly the Lord brings them about. And they're before me, and I'm seeing the desires of my heart today. They could have never happened if I would have lived a life of sin. It could have never happened. But God has given me the desires of my heart. This psalmist, he goes through the whole list of the things that the wicked do. And finally, somewhere along the line, he decided. And some of you need to listen now. Somewhere along the line, he realized that he was going down. Somewhere along the line, he realized that he had already gone down twice and he was going down the third time not to get up again. He was going to drown in self-pity, in doubts and fears and discouragements and worries and griefs. He was going to drown in it. And somewhere along the line, he decided, hey, listen, you know what? I had better get myself up and get back to the sanctuary of God. Somewhere along the line, there was a spark of faith that said, hey, you know what, I'd better go back to church. Do you know, you stay out of church, I don't care how sanctimonious you are, I don't care how righteous or self-righteous you are, you stay out of the house of God and you are going to get a nasty attitude. You call somebody on the phone and you say, how come you haven't been to church? Well, I tell you what, it's because of old brother so-and-so. I've had my fill of him, and if you think I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. It's true. I've had my fill of him. He is not a Christian. If he's a Christian, I'll fly into heaven. What those people never understand is, son, you're getting ready to go to the same place he's going. You want to spend eternity with him? 
If he's going to hell, I'd get to church and go to heaven and get away from him. And I'll tell you one thing, it's sister so-and-so. I've been going to that church for years and never been used. Never been asked to do this and never been asked to do that. Now, child, let me talk to you and let me be kind as a father would say to his children. It is not brother so-and-so. It's not sister so-and-so. It's not the pastor. It's not the point of being used or not used or abused. It is your attitude stinks. You need to get to the house of God. And somewhere along the line, this fellow decided that it maybe could have been him. He said, you know what, I never go to the sanctuary. And I can see him when he came in that Sunday morning. <laughs> Probably had a half. Well, I won't say that. But there were, uh, there were, there were things about his attire that you could tell, look. I've been out there, I've been messing around with sin, and don't bug me, boy. I just want to let you know that i got a bad attitude. I've seen them, and so have you. Yeah, I'm back, but that doesn't mean I'm going to pray through this morning. I've seen the come and so have you. I don't care what kind of a scowl you have on your face. I don't care what you have on your face. Whether you have anything on your face or not, or whether you have whatever. All I'm cared about is you finally made it back to the sanctuary, and God may be able to straighten your attitude out. And that old boy, he got back in the sanctuary this morning, and then he said, it was too much for me. When I began to consider those things, it, it was too much. It was too painful for me. I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't handle it. But then he said, until I went to the sanctuary... I got back in here. And you know what? When I got back in here and God began to work on me, I tell you something, things happen to you when you come to the house of God. The trouble that was a mountain suddenly becomes a molehill again. We are such magnifiers. We take a molehill, and out of the house of God, it becomes a mountain. But when we get back into the presence of God Almighty, it suddenly becomes a molehill. And I can deal with molehills. I can't deal with mountains. God deals with my heart. God deals with my heart. God deals with my eyes. You know what? There's something about all your faults that I hardly see when I'm religiously going to the sanctuary. But when I stay away from the sanctuary, you can't believe how bad your faults get. If you could just see how bad you are, when I stay away from the house of God. Why, the Lord gives us a fine tune-up and tunes up our attitude. He brings everything into perspective, proper perspective, so that I see clearly again. 
I see clearly again. You know, a lot of church members are like wheelbarrows. They're no good unless they're pushed. And some are like canoes. They're no good unless they're paddled. And then some are like kites. If a string isn't kept on them, they'll fly away. And then some are like kittens. More contented when petted. And some are like balloons. Full of wind, ready to blow up. Some are like footballs. You can't tell which way they're going to bounce next. Some are like trailers. They have to be pulled. Some are like neon lights. They keep going off and on. And many, thank goodness, are like the North Star. There when you need them, and you can depend on their loyalty forever. Hallelujah. I ran on to a little something about church attendance the other day that I thought I'd share with you. It's very, very good. It's the reasons why that I gave up sports. Now, this is the reason why this fellow gave up sports. Football in the fall, baseball in the summer, basketball in the winter. I've had it with them all. I quit attending sports once and for all, and here's my 11 excuses. Every time I went, they asked for money. The people that sat next to me didn't seem friendly. The seats were too hard and not comfortable at all. I went to many games, but the coach never came and called on me. The referees made decisions that I couldn't agree with. The game went into overtime, and I was late getting home. The band played numbers I've never heard before, and it wasn't my style of music anyway. It seems the games are always scheduled when I want to do other things. I suppose that I was sitting next to some hypocrites. They came to see their families and they talked during the whole game. I was taken to, to too many games by my parents when I was growing up. And finally... I hate to wait in the traffic jam in the parking lot after the game. That's why I gave up sports. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and even the more so as you see the day approaching. Oh, the excuses we make for not coming to the house of God. Even the more so, you know, to the real child of God and the one that wants to make heaven, church becomes his second home. It is his school where he learns. It is his hospital where he gets healed. It is his bank where he puts his money. And more importantly, he places his investments. Psalms 137.5 tells us, If I forsake the old Jerusalem, let my right hand forsake its cunningness. I'm going to tell you, the house of God is where we give the Lord thanks. The house of God is where repentance is found. The house of God is where the altars of dedication are made. The house of God is where I find forgiveness. The house of God is where I make my wrongs right. 
The house of God is where I forgive others. The house of God is where God heals me when I'm sick. The house of God is where I get my sins forgiven. The benefits of the house of God. Let me tell you folks, unless you make this your place of dwelling, the devil will make sure that you get your eyes on things out there that will discourage you and cause you to lose out with God. It is just a fact. Can we stand together? In the prayer. by a story that was told me this past week. I had known that story, but it had slipped my memory. But I was talking to my son and daughter-in-law, and they refreshed my memory. Brother Trapani, a minister of the gospel in our fellowship, also a noted marriage counselor, he was in San Diego this week, and they attended a couple of his sessions. And his wife told a story that just happened to them just a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago. Within a nine-month period, they lost two of their sons. One was on an outing with a group, church group, and he jumped into the water to, to uh, wash off or something. What he did not know, it was a 200 foot, I believe 200 foot depth at that point, and he was a very poor swimmer. He never came up. His mother and sister was on their way to the camp to see him. They arrived and without any notice, they were told that their son had drowned. Very, very traumatic, traumatic time. A short nine months later, their 19-year-old son was out playing football with a bunch of guys church and he was tackled and his head hit the ground and massive brain damage and he died sister Trapani said it was one of those slippery places that you're on God why do you do this to me now folks one sure thing, if you've never been on slippery places, you will be there. There are times that life demands so much of your faith, and it is only the strong that's going to make it. The Apostle Paul said that when I am weak, then am I strong. It seems in our weakest moments, and I don't believe that the Apostle Paul said when he was weak, it was when that he is about to give up. No, it was the weakness that he was talking about was when his faith had been tried to the nth degree and he didn't feel like that he could take anymore. 
it was at that point that he was the strongest because it was at that point that he failed to give up say God I don't understand it but I will tell you one thing God my faith is still in you I refuse to give up I am not going to give up I'm knocked down but I'm not knocked out I'm going to come again I'm going to go to your sanctuary my hands will lift up again when I get over this morning God my hands will rejoice again I will lift them up and I will thank you for all of your blessings oh my God my God my God we walk in slippery places friend but the battle is not over it is in those slippery places that you can show the strength of your faith. Hallelujah. As we sang, let's worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord for just a moment here. Hallelujah.